The image itself mm -hmm. <clears throat> lies, uh, and this is like a, a photographic negative image, and we'll talk about the three-dimensionality in just a moment. But the one thing to remember is that image is lying on the uppermost surface of the fibrils on the cloth. It never penetrates into the medulla of the fiber or into the middle of the cloth, just the uppermost uh, surface of the fibrils. Now, th that's where the crispiness is, as I was calling it. Now, that couldn't have happened because of liquids. If you, like, let's suppose you're trying to produce that image with a liquid. The liquid would have penetrated the medulla of the middle of the fiber and to the middle of the cloth, just like that. And not only would it have penetrated in the middle, it would have also, um, you know, started spangling into adjacent threads and so forth, making the image blurry and so forth. This is an exceedingly precise image, no blurriness at all. And as I said, it's uh, photographic negative. So the, the first thing to remember is, um, you know, uh, can't be produced by liquids. Can it be produced by vapors? Maybe there was some aloes that were mixed with the hot body after the crucifixion producing the vapors, and the vapors kind of moved into the cloth. Maybe that's what did the job. Absolutely no, because, of course, the, the vapors are going to penetrate into the middle of the fibers and the middle of the cloth, and it's going to be even worse spangling, even worse spread to the adjacent uh, fibers. More blurriness in the image. A vapor doesn't work uh, at all. How about scorching? Uh, it was burned in uh, in some way. Now, because we have a very easy test called fluorescing, which will determine <clears throat> very, very quickly that it was not scorched. Okay, so what's left over? Well, we know there's action at a distance. We know that there is <clears throat> inside information from the body. So the backbone inside the body is giving off an image mm -hmm. as much as the flesh surrounding that backbone and in perfect three-dimensional proportionality. So we know the distance from Jesus' backbone, from the man's backbone, uh, to the flesh surrounding it. Etc. Okay, now you look at that and you go, what can do this? There is only one explanation, radiation. In fact, another name for radiation is action at a distance. So in other words, radiation can cause something to happen, right, uh, at a distance without having to make contact. So there's a ton of places where the shroud cloth does not make contact with the body, hmm. yet the image is there, and it's in perfect, um, you know, three-dimensional proportionality uh, to the places that are in contact with the cloth. And not only that, as I said, the inside of the body is emblazoned on the shroud in perfect three-dimensional proportionality. The black backbone is in perfect proportionality to the flesh surrounding the backbone, etc. So we've got a perfect three-dimensional photographic negative emblazoned on a non-photographically sensitive linen cloth. Radiation, radiation, radiation. Now I'm going to cut to the chase. There are two hypotheses for what kind of radiation could do this. The first one is the John Jackson hypothesis. Very excellent super physicist uh, that uh, this guy and his team have produced a very strong um, explanation on the basis of what we call vacuum or columnated vacuum ultraviolet radiation. If this theory proves to be uh, the explanation, that would require, Lila, six to eight billion, with a B, billion watts of um, ultraviolet energy for one forty billionth of a second to produce that image. Now, if that were the case, think about that, six to eight billion watts of light energy. Well, that's like a half a million searchlights worth of light energy emerging out of that body for one forty billionth of a second producing this snapshot. Uh, let me think now, how many dead bodies produce a half a million searchlights worth of light energy for one forty billionth of a second. Zero except Jesus, because the cause cannot possibly be naturalistically. naturalistic. By the way, if you tried to produce that image with all the ultraviolet um, microwave radiation in the entire world today, it would require 14,000 ARF eczema lasers to do that, which is more than all of the capacity we have in the entire world in every laboratory today. 
Uh, how did the medieval forger pull that out? I don't, I don't think so. So, I mean, it's obviously a miracle, miracle, miracle with a capital M. Uh, no question about that. So that's a possibility. Here's the problem. There are 42 enigmas on the shroud, and only 21 of them are explained um, by uh, the ultraviolet radiation hypothesis. And even the uh, information from the backbone, the bones in the hand, the inside of the body, right, all that information is, is not going to be explained um, by the ultraviolet radiation hypothesis. A secondary hypothesis, which I'm a believer in, uh, this comes from uh, Jean-Baptiste Renaud uh, over at the Institut Physique in, in Paris, and Dr. Kitty Little, uh, who's over in um, uh, the um, Harwell uh, Laboratories in Great Britain, and also Dr. Arthur Lynn, who's here in this country, um, a very uh, esteemed, all of them very esteemed uh, physicists, uh, came up with another one called the particle radiation hypothesis. I'm going to cut to the chase here. He, this is basically what the hypothesis says, that at one specific time after the blood has already been embedded on the cloth, at one specific time, what you're going to see is the body is going to undergo complete nuclear dis, um, uh, disintegration, producing a low-temperature nuclear reaction simultaneously. As I said, the odds of that occurring by pure chance, uh, naturalistically, uh, is about the same odds as monkey typing at half a Macbeth. Uh, good luck on that. So the uh, perfectly uh, in a single try. So the good luck on that. That's a miracle if ever there was one. So what happened? Basically, uh, what is conjecture? When the uh, low temperature nuclear um, reaction occurred, basically there's a big light and a boom uh, that takes place. After the light, and, well, not after, but almost simultaneous with the light and the boom, you've got two fluxes, two flows of particles coming out positively charged heavy particles like protons and deuterons, and neutral, right? A non-charged uh, heavy particles called neutrons uh, that are coming out, and some other particles that are there, but just you call it neutrons for the sake of it. The main thing, though, that's uh, happening is uh, it explains all 42 enigmas on the shroud, every single one of them, and it leaves a remnant which can be tested in the next uh, exposition of the shroud, next scientific testing of the shroud, that would actually guarantee that this was the explanation. And to make a long story short, the, it's the, uh, what happens is you've got these positively charged uh, heavy particles. They're moving up uh, to the surface of the shroud. When they move up to, to the surface, the electrons that are embedded in the linen are going to start reacting mm -hmm. with the positively charged particles that are coming, and they stick. Where do they stick? Right at the uppermost surface of the fibrils where the crispiness of the image resides. So that's the precise spot. Now... The neutrons, on the other hand, they're not causing the image. They're going right through the cloth. And we're going to talk about five ways in which those neutrons affect the cloth. Let me just give you some of the um, things that um, are really important here. We always wondered, if this were a forgery, how could anybody, right? Let's suppose you Father, it's not a forgery. <laughs> I know, no. But I'm just going to give the I, hypothesis. Yeah, yeah. No. It, it, it's it's mind-blowing. It's okay. mind-blowing what you're saying. And it's yeah. mind-blowing that every single Christian... Every single Christian, I don't care if you're Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant, Evangelical, Bible, yeah. whatever you call yourself as a Christian, a believer, that you don't know about this oh. and you don't allow this to strengthen your faith yeah. and allow this to impassion you to want to share the good news of the resurrection with every yeah. single person that you know. Oh, yeah. And I mean, like I said... Um, it's it's so convincing. I, I'm 99.9% .9 sure. Like I said, we could never explain how that cloth could have ever been removed by a human being or a mechanical means. Because if you remove the cloth from the dead body where the blood was already adhering, it would segment, fragment, and smear every single blood stain, practically every single blood stain on that cloth. But none of them are smeared, fragmented, and saved. So you're saying the cloth, cloth was miraculously removed from Jesus. Exactly. In other words, the body disappeared from underneath it and wow. left the blood perfectly intact. But that's an explanation. Second thing to look at is we always wondered, hey, how could um, uh, the image uh, uh, be on the inside of the uh, from the inside of the body as well as the surface of the body? How could that happen? Well, just think about it for a second. 
the, the um, protons and deuterons that are causing the image, they leave the surface of the body at the same time that um, the backbone ones, let's say the backbone particles are leaving the backbone. But the backbone ones have more distance to travel. Well, a split second distance to travel. But notice how then the other ones, the surface ones, are already out of the way. By the time the particles from the backbone are trying to get up, um, you know, uh, to the surface of the body, notice that they're already, all the other particles that were in front of it, as it were, they're all cleared out. And because they're all cleared out, Essentially, they go and they create an image of the backbone as well. So we can explain totally how you can get a perfect image of what's inside the body as well as outside the body with perfect three-dimensional proportionality. We always wondered why the blood stains were bright red. It couldn't be explained by Billy Rubin alone or something like that. We always wondered, and now we know. Because when you er what we call irradiate blood with neutrons, so you, if you, you you know these neutrons are passing heavy part passing through this blood, and when you they pass through very rapidly, they irradiate the blood, and that irradiation that lasts for a long time. So of course, if you put that irradiated blood out in a regular old sunlight, like say on an ex exhibition, it turns bright red. Every single one of those things. Again, we couldn't explain that uh, previously. Mm -hmm. We always wondered, why is it that the frontal and the dorsal images, right? The dorsal back, the frontal is front. Mm -hmm. And why they are at equal intensities. After all, gravity should act on the body, um, you know, and so push the, the, shroud, uh, the body down onto the shroud, giving a more precise, clear image. But nay, the, uh, uh, basically the, um, uh, the images are identical intensity. How could this happen? Because in every nuclear reaction, there is truly what we call a vacuum, right? And the vacuum sucks both sides of the cloth toward the center at equal intensities. I mean, I'm talking about every 42 enigmas we could never explain, and all of them are explained by this hypothesis. There's also a definitive test that can be made. In every low-temperature nuclear reaction, there are going to be what we call cosmogenic isotopes, um, that, that basically like calcium-41 or chlorine-36, which, you know, they, they never occur in any abundance except near Near a nuclear reaction or an outer space where you have some novas and supernovas and things. Okay, so the main thing though is if we get this cloth and we find any abundance of cosmogenic isotopes in this cloth, I'm telling you, the, the particle radiation hypothesis is the explanation. So here in a nutshell is what I think um, happened and I think it had to be produced by God because you can't have you know, seven octillions, perfectly stable atomic nuclei disintegrating simultaneous without, you know, uh, God doing the work because it ain't naturalistic. And what you're about to say is ultimately the scientific explanation for the resurrection of the crucified Jesus Christ. Well, that's pretty much it. I mean, basically, I think what happened is uh, as Jesus um, is uh, lying there with the blood, of course, uh, on his body, etc., what happens is kaboom, you know, big flash of light. Simultaneously, the protons and deuterons are flying up into, you know, interacting with the electrons in the cloth and producing this three-dimensional photographic negative image right there on the cloth. The neutrons are passing through that cloth and not only making the blood bright red, but they're reinforcing it, right? The neutrons uh, tear all what's called the, the, the linear uh, bonds, um, you know, uh, there, there's car carbonyl bonds in, in the cloth and those carbonyl bonds are torn, the linear ones are weak ones, tear them apart and they reconfigure them in a crystalline fashion, which is very, very, very uh, strong. That explains why the shroud is so resistant uh, to um, uh, um, uh, uh, solvents, so resistant to age, um, and uh, so resistant to incessant touching and everything else that's happened to it. And it shows none of the signs of wear and tear because the carbonyl bonds have been almost transformed into crystalline ones from this neutron flux, this neutron discharge. So the main thing uh, to, to see, though, in, in all of this is these particles are flying up and they're leaving us truly not just with a picture, but the picture is 
constituted by the physical particles that were the residual, uh, as it were, of Jesus' physical body. When those particles are transformed, as it were, uh, integrated into the spiritual body, that he becomes the residual of those particles is embedded right there in that cloth, along with the blood that leaves, as it were, the remnant of his entire body there, um, you know, in the picture for us to see along with his blood that not only validates that it is really him, but validates the narratives, the gospel narratives about this event and even validates the spiritual resurrection that's talked about in the scriptures. At the end of the day, Lila, I would just say this. I would say that God planned this 2,000, almost 2,100 years ago. And now that the scientists are finally discovering what wonders the Lord has worked, he's sitting up in heaven with a big smile going, gotcha. <laughs>